welcome everyone. I'm really excited that Nick and I are going to talk to y'all today. It's all about back to school. It's that time of year already. The kiddos are back. So we're going to help you with some tips and tricks to smooth out this initial back to school time of year. And I want to just take a minute for us to introduce ourselves. Um, so I'm Dr. Laura Rowley. I am the director of our assessment and testing program here at Utah Center for Evidence-Based Treatment. I specialize assessing ADHD and autism in our kids and adults and work a lot with parents on parenting interventions for behavior problems. And I'll let Nick introduce himself. Hi, yeah, I'm Nicholas Scholars. Um, I'm an assessment and testing team member here at UCEBT. Um, my specialty is in assessing ADHD and specific learning disabilities, and I have a lot of experience um, working in the public school systems, um, helping uh, teachers and parents uh, develop like individualized education plans and 504s and things like that. All right. So um, I want to address a little bit why we chose to focus on neurodiversity and particularly individuals with ADHD and autism. Um, we really see that these kiddos struggle with things like executive functioning or socio-emotional skills that tend to really impact school functioning or maybe more increased vulnerability for environmental stressors. And we're going to get into that with some data about COVID-19. Um, but in general, I think it's hard for everyone right now, or has been the last couple of years. And so we're even seeing in our neurotypical students that there are some challenges with things like sustained attention and completing tasks and some emotional regulation. So these strategies are really designed to tackle some of these underlying skills or deficits that can translate across diagnoses, across neurodiverse, neurotypical, across ages. And so we think there's something that could really be helpful for everyone in here. Um, we are going to be using Slido throughout this talk. Slido is a really cool way um, for y'all to be able to engage, submit questions, answer polls. And so if you wanna join at slido.com, that is our meeting number. And I just, I'm throwing a question out here of generally like what brings you here? Like what is something you're hoping to learn from today? What would be most helpful to you? And as a way to practice using this polls, we'll have a couple other polls down in the presentation um, or just general questions. And so anytime throughout the talk, you can submit a question through the Slido and I'll see it here. Um, or you can use the chat and they'll message us <laughs> those questions. And many of you submitted questions prior to this talk. So we'll also get to those. There's a lot of way to ask questions. So feel free to do whatever route works best for you. So let's see if um, our, is this poll working? Oh, perfect. Yes, we got a first answer. Lovely interventions, support kids and parents, tips and tricks, strategies and tools to use in school. Love that. Yeah, we're, got, we're gonna cover all of those today. Um, okay, except you can submit things at any time, any questions you have that come up. The polls also, I think, remain open throughout here. So lots of ways to submit things. Listening, completing tasks, understand their struggles. Older teens who don't want their parents involved. Yeah, <laughs> that's very real. I love it. Okay. Um, yeah. Continue to push your, uh, continue to submit anything. Oh, yes. Many of you who know people personally, for sure. Okay. So, I want to, generally, this is going to be a little bit of our approach of how we conceptualize some of these challenges. So if we look at systems theory, it posits that, you know, for every individual, every child in this context, they have different things affecting their behavior, right? So we have the immediate environment, we have different connections to more indirect environment, 
social and cultural values and just generally the time period, right? And so in this particular setting, we're looking at, we have our kids and teens, we have their parents, we have schools and peers, we have their larger community and social media, which we'll touch on a little bit as well, general socioeconomic and cultural context, and obviously the time period that we're in, largely pandemic times, among other things that are impacting. So we're going to try to touch on essentially each of these spheres. Um, but before we dive deeply into that, I want to just get some quick definitions on the table of like what these particular traits are. So we have the diagnostic criteria, which is more from a disordered lens, but people with ADHD have difficulty with sustained attention, paying attention to details, listening, avoiding tasks, and then our hyperactive side, we have the fidgeting, interrupting, moving around. From the autism perspective, we have two broad categories of traits, one related to social communication and reciprocity, the other one related to repetitive movements, fixed interests. Um, and so this is how they're defined diagnostically. However, it's quite lacking, I think, in the true like holistic, what these kids and teens really offer. And so from a strengths-based perspective, these are also some traits we notice. Um, from ADHD, we have creativity, jumping into things and spontaneity, energy, sense of humor. They can take in a lot of information all at once. From autism, we have talking passionately about those interests, noticing details, really excellent skills at developing concrete, consistent routines, systems, um, memorizing information, logical thinking, visual spatial skills, sometimes being actually quite socially perceptive, despite some maybe like misconception that that's true, because you know, from an adaptable standpoint, they're really great at noticing and mimicking other people's behavior. Um, and both of them are have these moments of hyper focus that can be really harnessed. And so some of these interventions that we're going to present might tap into these strengths. So I'm curious just to hear from your perspective, either as a provider, educator, parent, to someone in the world, what do you feel like, if anything, you've noticed when you compare pre-post, we're not post-COVID, but like post-COVID existing, if that makes sense. Um, we're seeing more social anxiety, yeah. Yeah, just a feel for what's the current landscape do you feel like? that makes this particular time period maybe harder? Or is it that different? And maybe it's just we're more stressed, more depression, school refusal. Yep. Totally. Less social. Mm -hmm. Anxiety. Social, yeah. So these are definitely lacking of discipline from parents, how to do school, leaving the house online. So these have some definite themes of like these socio-emotional skills and regulation skills that are really impacting kids. And that's exactly what we're targeting today. Um, lack of interest. So um, I am going to, divisiveness between groups of people, yeah. I'm going to, at this moment, we're gonna switch over to Nick and he's gonna share data about COVID and how that's affected our kids and teens. Um, and yeah, just the general landscape of things before we shift to the intervention. So take it away, Nick. All right, can y'all see my screen? Yeah. Awesome, can you see my notes? No. Okay, good. <laughs> awesome, so I'll be talking to you today um, about uh, COVID-19's effects, particularly on um, neurodivergent children. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is, uh, Laura and I chose to include a section on COVID-19 um, it's because the pandemic's impact on children's schooling was so universal um, that it can't really be left out of a child's conceptualization um, anymore. Um, and because most 
COVID related deaths were in older populations, um, school children have largely been thought to kind of have fared better in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and while it's true that they suffered less instances of like acute respiratory illness, um, research is also showing now that COVID may have affected them more in the long-term impact, especially I really like the biopsychosocial model of functioning. And so what I'll be doing today is kind of going through how COVID-19 impacted kids um, biologically, psychologically, um, and socially. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the, the big first things um, is that there was a powerful study that came out of uh, the Netherlands, um, which was able to collect the data of around 350,000 students. Um, and one unique thing about the Dutch education system is that they hold standardized testing twice a year, once in January and once in June. Um, and during the first wave of the pandemic, the Netherlands um, public schools only shut down for about eight weeks. So this means that they were able to gather that preschool closure data um, in January and the post-school closure data um, in June after the kids had come back to in-person learning. Um, and then they compared that to um, kids from other school years. Um, and what they found was that um, at the end of the school year, students who had been through the school closure were behind previous year students by approximately one fifth of the school year, which is about as long as the eight week school closure was at least for um, the Dutch education system. And so what they what that kind of showed is that the online learning um, hadn't had a lot of effect in, in helping kids um, learn. Um, and that's not to say that the school closures were unwarranted because people were dying, um, but it just kind of goes to show like the impact of um, the school closures on kids' is education. Um, when they added an additional factor in, uh, which was the education of the parents and the resources of the home, they found that those learning mul losses multiplied for those children by 60%. Um, and I think what's unique and powerful about a study like this um, is that the, the Netherlands has a very equitable education system. Um, each district is federally funded and they all received an equal amount of school funding. Um, and Dutch people also have a very high access rate to Wi-Fi. Um, it's very easy for people to access an internet connection, meaning children had an easier time connecting to the internet um, when they were doing online school, um, which means that this study kind of represents a best case scenario. Um, in the US, our school closures are, um, were longer, um, at least depending on state. Um, and uh, Wi-Fi isn't as accessible to some communities. Um, and so we're also funded by local property taxes. So that means that like schools uh, in less resource communities receive less funding than schools in more resource communities. So the potential for inequality is a lot higher in the US than it is in the Netherlands. Um, and I guess the reason why I point all that stuff out is that if the Netherlands is a best case scenario, um, it's very likely that depending on the community you're working in, um, you may find kids who have suffered much more than what this study is showing. Um, and so as you move forward as a clinician or a parent or a teacher, you know, I think it's important to know from the beginning that COVID-19 likely affected children um, educationally, physically, psychologically, socially, um, etc. So, um, and I want to touch briefly on the biological impacts of COVID on children, um, especially those who are not neurodivergent. So again, it's true that children were not as in danger from dying of COVID directly, um, but it's not true that it was kind of a harmless health event. So one well-known symptom, um, one that I experienced when I caught COVID was this loss of taste and smell. Um, and that's not life-threatening on its own, but it really alarmed neuroscientists because it indicated that COVID was somehow harming our neurons um, if it was able to eradicate our sense of taste and smell. Um, and new research into COVID-19 is showing that it has neuroinflammatory properties similar to the flu and rubella, um, and that it specifically seems to be um, attacking the microglia um, in our brains. Now, I went through a bio basis of behavior class in doctor school, but I needed a little refresher. So um, in case you do as well, uh, microglia are kind of often thought of as like the brain's immune system. 
um, unlike other neuronal cells, um, they originate from the same stem cells as white blood cells do. So, and they kind of hover through the brain and perform maintenance checks on all of our neurons. And if the neuron's not working or if it's performing like a redundant function, they'll literally rip it up with those little arms that you see there in the picture. Um, and it is a very, you know, that sounds like really morbid and stuff. And sometimes it can be, but it's also a very important process with um, synaptic pruning, which is a big deal um, in ch child development. Um, it's the brain's natural way of kind of ordering itself as a child grows up and has new experiences. Um, it's important for the development of children's um, executive functions. And so when we think about neurodivergent children, we're already talking about children whose synaptic pruning processes are progressing in ways that are very difficult um, from what is typical and um, from the way society is set up. Um, so that kind of goes for the argument that, you know, there's an extra threat, threat to synaptic pruning that COVID might pose to neurodivergent children when compared to neurotypical children. Um, my mouse cursor just turned invisible, so there we go. Okay, I can press my space bar. Um, so kind of going along with more neurological effects, um, if you think about it, um, you know, what is it that we all heard throughout the COVID-19 pandemic? There were a lot of things we heard, but one of them was that people with comorbid medical diagnoses were more at risk for severe COVID symptoms. Again, my brain kind of like immediately associated to people who were older as being the main population with comorbid uh, medical diagnoses, um, but medical comorbidity exists across the spectrum. So research shows that um, the, the rates of medical comorbidity is actually higher in children with ADHD and autism. Um, so logically we can expect that neurodivergent children will likely have suffered more from COVID-19 than their neurotypical peers. So that cognitive damage um, for those that caught it um, might be a little more acute. Um, and I think what this really drives home is that COVID-19 um, did affect children physically, just didn't kill them as often, um, which is, I mean, you know, it's good that we, that children weren't dying. Um, and it also doesn't mean that nothing happened to them. So um, these are major enough effects though to warrant attention when we're trying to come up with helpful interventions as we kind of come out um, on the back end of this pandemic, or at least the back end of the school closures. Um, and so again, I love the biopsychosocial approach. And so what I'm gonna try to do is stick with it. So I started with the brain and now I wanna kind of demonstrate on how that might show up in our psychological measure, measures. Um, so we know that microglial disruption can affect multiple psychological functions. For example, phonological processing um, is affected by microglial damage. So that ability to kind of hear sounds and categorize them and link them with letters. Um, and so is vocabulary development. And that would kind of make sense in that phonological stuff is kind of needed to develop a good vocabulary. Um, microglia are also important for the development of the amygdala, and that is also disrupted, we see, when uh, microglial dysfunction happens, and so that can happen, or what that could lead to would be emotional dysregulation, um, or maybe developmental lags in emotional regulation, um, and so it's possible that we might begin to see in schools more difficulty in academic areas like reading and writing, as well as behavioral areas like emotional dysregulation. Again, this is true for neurotypical children as well as neurodivergent children. Um, you know, but neurodivergent children already learn these skills differently. So there's gonna be potential for neurodivergent children to be impacted more by any sort of cognitive effects that may come as a result of having had COVID-19. Um, and so now I wanna move into the social emotional effects of COVID-19. Um, there's a very good study that came out of the UK this past year that measured um, if the awareness of COVID-19 was more stressful for neurodivergent kids. Um, and as, again, not to say that COVID was a breeze for everybody else. Um, and the study also shows that there were some unique stress factors for neurodivergent kids. Um, so when the authors polled like 400 parents, they split the groups between parents of neurodivergent children and parents of neurotypical children. And the results showed that, that people um, were stressed across the board. Um, uh, and parents of neurotypical children reported that their children's stress tended to be the result of feeling socially isolated. 
Um, on the other hand, parents of neurodivergent children reported that their children's awareness of the pandemic itself tended to be more stressful. Um, that is, neurodivergent, neurodivergent children uh, seem to have be more worried about the virus itself, whereas neurotypical children were kind of more worried or at least consciously focused on kind of those societal effects that the virus was having. Um, and the authors kind of postulate in the study that one of the reasons this was the case is because schools play such a large role in the routine of neurodivergent child's lives. Um, so parents in the study reported that school closures were a factor in their kids' stress because of how it disrupted their routine. Parents reported that one of the ways it manifested in their children was in the form of behavioral regression. So behaviorals that had been learned in certain contexts at school, um, they were having difficulty generalizing it to the online learning um, environment. And so it seems like the knowledge of the virus and its impact on their environment might have been too sudden and too intense for some children. Um, again, these factors on their own are worth attention, um, but they also kind of reach full circle back to the brain um, and connect back to that neuronal development. We know from attachment research um, that those social interactions are really powerful for children. And so not being able to have those um, quite possibly could have led to um, slowing down of some of that neuronal development. Um, and so now, you know, that was all kind of like background, I guess, like vaccines are out now, hopefully COVID rates are going down, um, or at least like serious cases, and schools have opened up, so now we're, we're going back. Um, and for many people, schools have already been back in session for the last year. Um, but I, uh, you know, hopefully COVID will remain under control enough to allow students to continue to attend school in person. Um, but uh, yeah, so the research I just mentioned strongly points to the importance of a routine for the neurodivergent child. So if that routine is disrupted, it can cause the child a great deal of stress. Um, and that being said, routines are interrupted all the time. Um, and so it's gonna be important to kind of have a contingency plan in place even in the future. Um, in whatever case, if you find yourself without a routine, um, the best thing to do is to try to establish a new one as soon as possible. Um, and we'll go uh, into that a little more detail um, in a minute. Um, and another thing to think about is that expectations on behavior might have changed um, due to COVID. There may still be social distancing in some schools. Um, masks might be encouraged if students are sick. Um, and these are things that are going to need to be incorporated into how we form routines for our neurodivergent children and kind of the social rules we're teaching them. Um, there's also likely that effect on children's social skills, you know, and I saw some of you typing about that um, in the Slido just a minute ago. Um, states varied widely in how long they were closed. Um, and so this may fluctuate depending on where your child or your client was um, during the pandemic. Um, from my experience this past year, as someone who worked in a public school in Oregon, during the kids uh, first year back, we saw a big uptick in behavioral symptoms. So in Oregon, schools shut down almost immediately when the pandemic hit and they didn't open for the rest of that school year and for most of the next school year. Um, and so um, they were out of school for a pretty long time. So the classroom behaviors that were considered appropriate when they were in fourth grade, for example, were no longer appropriate or at least no longer tolerable from a developmental perspective. Um, in sixth grade. But what we found was we were having to kind of adjust those expectations because of how much it impacted behavioral, social, emotional development across the board. And so um, hopefully now being a year out from that, uh, we might be getting some good research soon to see if these kind of developmental lags were kind of transient and the kids bounce back um, or if they're more chronic. Um, but I think what's important is like when you see kids who went through the pandemic, and they're being referred for behavioral concerns, it's gonna be a good idea to think about how old they were when the pandemic started and how that kind of lines up with where um, they're expected to be currently. Um, and kind of some like go-to strategies, uh, the University of North Carolina School of Education um, 
introduce like a, some really helpful programming for supporting neurodivergent kids in uncertain times. So it was kind of catalyzed um, for COVID, but they made it generalizable in case in the future there's any other sort of societal crises that require um, major upheavals in routine. Um, so they started with seven strategies. I'll just briefly go through them um, for emotional support. Um, and then we can move forward with kind of integrating those to the larger theme of going back to school for this year, 2022. So the first strategy is to support your neurodivergent child's understanding of what's going on in the world. So there was so much misinformation in our society regarding the pandemic um, that it was even difficult for adults to get a grip on what was happening. Um, we were hearing so many different things. It was changing by the day. Um, and so making sure our kids have an accurate um, information or counseling parents that you're, uh, maybe you're engaging in like uh, parent management training and those types of things. Um, making sure that those kids have accurate information um, is going to be very important um, to avoid any sort of like alarmist um, or, you know, reactions to things that might not actually even be true. Um, the second strategy is offering opportunities for expression. So giving your child or your client time to engage in the arts or uh, creative therapy interventions. Um, these are going to help kids process those feelings that might not, they might not be able to put words to. Um, the next one is prioritizing coping skills. Um, adults needed to learn this lesson. I, I needed to <laughs> sharpen my coping skills during the pandemic. And um, this is going to hold even more true for our child clients. So if our kids can't calm themselves, it's going to be very difficult for them to engage in these other strategies because they're going to be so activated. Um, and as I've already mentioned, maintaining routines is extremely important. So if schools close, um, consider keeping your child's wake up routine the same, even though school starts later or school starts on the computer. Um, consider leaving breakfast routine the same, even if you're not rushing out the door. Um, and then maintaining the routines that aren't directly affected by whatever societal crisis comes along can really help uh, the transition be easier. Um, fostering connections. I still think that in-person interaction is the gold standard, obviously, but uh, if COVID taught me one thing, it's that, you know, a well-timed Zoom call with friends can make a huge difference in like staving off depression and feelings of anxiety. Um, and then lastly, being aware of changing behavior. So kids are moving targets when it comes to therapeutic uh, intervention. So societal crises might take their toll. We might see some behavioral regression and kids might also uh, continue to develop. And so we'll need to adjust our interventions to kind of fit their developmental level. Um, and then lastly, UNC also provided some strategies for returning to school. Um, the first being a schedule. You know, I keep mentioning that it's just such a big um, help for returning to school. Um, it's very helpful for neurodivergent children to know exactly how they're gonna make their way from bed to the classroom each morning. Um, and this can mean creating a task analysis, which is essentially, you know, breaking a task down into more manageable steps. And you can even give it to someone to read through and have them follow a routine um, and see if it makes sense to them or if you need to adjust it. Um, physical structuring of the environment is important too. So laying out a child's backpack um, or having them pick out their clothes the previous night can go a long way towards kind of reducing that cognitive load in the morning as they're making their way towards school. Um, and then another helpful strategy is having them understand kind of the social narrative um, for why it's good for them to perform the task. So if children know why they're doing what they're asked to do, they're much more likely to you know, put in the time to learn the task. Um, things like videos, signs and cards, these can give children the opportunity, especially with that high visual spatial function to kind of see these tasks uh, in real time and also learn that social narrative through a, a a visual perspective. Um, and then lastly, reinforcement will be your best friend. So find those uh, things that help your child feel validated and pair them up with completing those routines. Um, we know that uh, punishing uh, people for not doing things, it may suppress the unwanted behavior for a time, but as soon as you remove it, it comes right back. Um, it does not help them internalize the task. 
doesn't help them develop independence or self-esteem. And this is where reinforcement really shines uh, as an intervention. And I think um, that's where it's gonna be more helpful to actually helping our kids develop. Um, so now I'll move it over to Laura again um, for the educational planning section. Hello, yes. So um, all of those strategies that Nick just went over, we are going to take and break them down further and give more details throughout this presentation. So that's just kind of like an overview of these are the evidence-based like pieces that we want to incorporate. And so, yes, we know it's not enough to be like, yes, have a routine, have reinforcement. We're going we're gonna to show you how. Um, but first, let's talk about the educational planning piece. We're starting here because... Um, just obviously we're psychologists. So like through our lens, we most likely tend to get involved in like one of two ways. One is through evaluation and diagnosis. And the other is through kind of like therapy modalities or like parent coaching or parent-child therapy. And so we're starting here um, because again, we're tending to be the ones that tend to be on the more evaluation side and the more like engage in this interdisciplinary team. And so we're gonna walk through what does that look like from like a formal intervention in the school's place. So interdisciplinary teams in this context can look a lot like having, you know, obviously the child is involved in their parents or caregivers. From the school side, we have their teachers, counselors, administrators, there might be like occupational therapy, speech language therapy, um, looping in that pediatrician from the medication standpoint, and then mental health specialists, you know, a psychologist, therapist, um, to provide that like additional intervention if that's needed beyond the school. So I want to go over these two options essentially for formal educational intervention. We have our individualized education plan and our 504 plans and kind of like what they have in common and what they're different. They're two different laws, like one, the IEPs from the IDEA law, and that requires supporting accommodations, specialized instruction for kids with disabilities. And they include specific goals, specific assessment, um, and require that services are provided in the least restrictive environment. And so what that means is like, we're trying to, you know, the least restrictive would be, you know, the general education environment, what supports might they need to be successful in there. If that doesn't work, we step them down to maybe some pullout, we step them down to like a more, um, isolated classroom, you know, essentially. So you're trying to keep them least restrictive as possible. It's using grades K through 12, actually younger, you know, if there's preschool, but we're not talking about preschool right now, K through 12. So 504 is a little bit different. It's more about having this law preventing discrimination due to disability and requires that people provide like reasonable accommodation for that. And so it's not going to have like directed specialized intervention and less involved with like the testing and data collection, um, but they do provide accommodation. They're a little bit more accessible and you can use them in college on like the IEP. So for the IEP, there's several, there's 13 classifications. And so obviously um, I kind of highlighted the main ones that would like tap into this population we're talking about, like obviously autism. <laughs> and then OHI is bolded because that's kind of what ADHD gets a bit lumped into at times because there's now a separate ADHD classification. But we might also see students have characteristics associated with these other ones like intellectual disability, emotional disturbance for severe psychiatric problems, um, specific learning disabilities and like reading, writing, math, speech language impairments. And so our interventions that we're gonna be talking about today are more so related to, as I said, executive functioning regulations. So we're not, we're assuming in this talk that these kids have like about average cognitive abilities, not severe emotional disturbance, um, relatively on par learning, um, and then um, not significant speech and language problems. So that's kind of like the lens that we're viewing this today. We have to talk about assessment. And so before we can do any intervention planning goal setting, we have to know what we're dealing with. And so assessment has different components for not only just the IEP or the 504, but just like largely any intervention. Here's what assessment can look like. 
observation. We're going to have input from the teachers and parents, observations from clinicians. It will include potentially formal psychoeducational evaluations and then something called functional behavioral assessment, which I want to go further into. Functional behavioral assessment is just kind of a fancy way of saying like you're really looking at what causes the behavior and what are the effects of that behavior. <laughs> what drives that behavior? Um, and so even when maybe a few of you have like some submitted questions about like what situations is it necessary to have like a full formal psycho ed or what if families can't access that, I think a functional behavioral assessment is a great place to start um, because it's really about organizing our observations and developing interventions effective for your kids' unique behaviors, kind of regardless of diagnosis, regardless of whatever characteristics. And so um, psycho or educators or like school psychologists will kind of do this in the school setting, but we would also do this over here in the intervention mental health setting. Um, so to do a functional behavioral assessment, you're gonna really get concrete and objective with your behaviors. So if you have like a broad complaint from a parent that or a teacher, you know, students like defiant, what does that look like exactly? Um, so an example could be like, does not complete math worksheets when asked, right? You're getting real specific on what do you mean by defiance? You have to identify the context of this behavior, like when is it happening but even maybe more importantly sometimes is when is it not happening like when are they able to meet these expectations and can we use that information to like enhance that happening in other contexts um what happens right before what happens right after so we're really looking at kind of the abc's antecedents behavior consequences as a cause and effect um determine the function. Like, why is this child doing this behavior? Um, sometimes that's kind of like a question that doesn't come across adults sometimes. <laughs> like, we're just like, why are they not? They're just like, they're just not doing it on purpose. And it's like, I don't know that a kid always purposefully would just like wake up and be like, I choose violence today sometimes. But um, usually there's a reason, right? And we maybe don't often stop to think about what that could be. So are they avoiding something in particular? Is it anxiety? Is it depression? Is it, are they seeking support from adults in a certain way, but they don't know how to communicate that? Like, what is the need that's not being met? That's what really drives behaviors. So one potential explanation for the example we gave in that beginning, student avoids math worksheets because they struggle to show their work. So they don't know how to break down a process into step-by-steps and communicate those step-by-steps to another person, right? So if they have that skill, maybe they'd stop avoiding math homework, right? So that is kind of a functional behavioral assessment at play. Shifting a little bit to psychoeducational evaluations. So this would be something that either happens at the school or with us outside the school that involves like formal psychological testing. So we'll have standardized measures of where kids are at for their cognitive abilities, for their academics, for their executive functioning, among other things, including like behaviors, social, emotional behaviors, symptoms, et cetera. We'll have standardized report measures that are normed and have like certain clinical cutoffs or percentiles from parents, from teachers. And our role is to really like integrate all of that data and make it make sense and come up with the explanation of why these behaviors are happening. Identify what are the kids' strengths? What are the kids' weaknesses? How do they compare to like where we would expect their developmental expectations to be um, and maybe what's missing? And so some of you guys had some really good questions um, about like is a formal evaluation always necessary or like what do we do for families that can't always access that and so like here's kind of why evaluation broadly is important um it allows us to understand like where are their abilities at so that we could set these expectations right like we might assume like oh a child should be able to do that you know in third grade all third graders should be able to do that or like all you know middle schoolers should be able to do that but we don't know uniquely where they might be falling. And so we need to know how to set goals appropriately so that they're attainable, so that they're realistic. Um, diagnosis, 
provides directions to start with targeting intervention because usually the same outward behavior can have multiple possible reasons for why that's occurring. Take something like defiance, for instance, like is it ADHD and they're just being more impulsive and focusing on like short-term gain rather than long-term, you know, achievement? Is it, you know, sensory overwhelm and they're just really wanting to get out of that environment and not able to kind of like think through their behaviors? Is it anxiety that's contributing to avoidance? Is it depression contributing to like low motivation, right? Is it trauma that's really like overwhelming their system in all kinds of ways that makes it really challenging to be consistent, to have parent support. So the reason for assessment is to parse apart all those pieces of like, how do these all fit together? What is driving this? Um, it doesn't always have to be formal psychoeducational evaluation, I guess, from like the, the, from us, if that makes sense. So usually the schools will do it if there's like significant, you know, if these behaviors are showing up at school and are having a hard time, you know, meeting expectations, either behaviorally or grades wise, the school will complete, right, their own psychoed evaluation, um, right, at like no cost to the parent. Um, parents also have the right to request an independent educational evaluation, meaning like if they disagree with what the school's kind of evaluation has shown or like feeling like it's not meeting their kids needs they can have an outside organization do the evaluation and again that will be covered by the school and not the parent um if there's harder time if we do need that like larger psychological evaluation but their access is limited there's like a few different strategies um you don't have to wait often time for formal diagnosis to get going on intervention like you can have behavior management strategies that support again some of these behaviors more broadly you can have classroom accommodations that support these behaviors more broadly you can have things like occupational therapy speech therapy right without that formal diagnosis and so there's a lot you can access without it you can have medication coming from you know the psychiatrist or the um, child's pediatrician doing some like thorough interviewing and screening and like trial it and see how it goes um if you really want that evaluation but again it's hard to access because of like I know the wait lists out here in the world are insanely long and then the cost is high for those who are not using insurance there's um any like university clinic would have like training graduate students that like need to do this or are closely supervised by licensed clinicians, but they can offer those services at a lower cost. So you can definitely hit up your local universities like the U up here, BYU down in Utah County. Um, so those are, there's many options um, that allow some access to this information. I said functional behavioral assessment can occur across settings. Different professionals are able to do it. So hopefully that answers that question. And yeah, I'll continue to put things in the um, Q&A on the Slido or in our chats if you end up having more questions that come up. Um, okay, evaluation is important also because there are certain populations where it's less recognized or have like even harder time accessing intervention and services. So um, I want to talk a little bit about assigned female at birth individuals, so fem assigned female at birth or women. They are much less likely to be recognized um, compared to males because they tend to present a little bit differently or our expectations of them are different or maybe it doesn't show up until later in life as overtly. They tend to have like less repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. Social or special interests might be more socially acceptable relationships um, might not be like this lack of being able to form friendships, but might be just more like as the quality of their relationships gets more complex, it might not be as deep and they tend to have stronger verbal abilities. So like if you're interacting with them, it seems like they're with you, but that's like masking underlying struggles. So this can look like really having friends in childhood, but then not keeping up with that when they get to like middle school or high school, not being aware of things and being more susceptible to be peer victimization, having just general like immaturity, um, really watching from the sidelines, copying, practicing, like even more so than usual. Sensory overwhelm is actually more like mislabeled as like, oh, they're just being dramatic or emotional and they might not connect with traditional gender roles. This is something that's interesting for um, 
individuals who are neurodiverse is they also tend to have a higher proportion of like LGBTQA plus individuals in that population compared to the neurotypical population. And so um, we have that interesting interplay of like vulnerabilities and like maybe overt behaviors that are misapplied to things like gender dysphoria, which could be a role or just, again, just a general like standing out. So other population considerations for our BIPOC individuals, the rates of autism and ADHD occur pretty consistently across racial and ethnic groups. Like there's no suggestion that like inherently there's one population that it happens more so than others. Um, it's just there's certain populations where it's less likely to be diagnosed early, diagnosed correctly, and give access to intervention. So usually what happens is, unfortunately, our BIPOC children are mislabeled as having conduct disorders, um, oppositional defiance, or just being like bad kids. Um, and then we're not really getting at that underlying what's driving those behaviors as effectively until maybe they're much older. Um, so that is definitely a barrier. We have other barriers to diagnosis and effective um, understanding of the problem in those communities, there might be a mistrust of systems, which is warranted. <laughs> it makes sense just given provider bias. There's a lot of research that suggests like, it's kind of like two extremes. Like either the providers are more likely to dismiss parental concerns and just be like, oh, that's just the misbehaving or whatever. Or they take the other extreme approach and tend to have like much more aggressive intervention than they would for white counterparts. So for instance, like prescribing really strong antipsychotics for kids with ADHD or autism who have maybe like some emotional dysregulation, which is maybe typical in that population. But then like, again, the intervention tends to be much heavier. So there's those pieces. Um, sometimes in these communities, problems aren't seen as requiring formal intervention. Like, like there was a study of Hispanic families, for instance, where they were looking at barriers to seeking supports either through the school or through medical intervention. And they just had this perception that like, well, if my kid doesn't do homework, like that's not something you go to the doctor for, you know, like that's just like a discipline issue. That's like, a, you know, that's just not like something that's seen as you know, you have these accesses and resources that can help or like why you would seek out support. Um, there's also something called the frog pond effect. Um, I don't know how this got developed, but essentially this is a phenomenon that exists kind of across diagnoses. So not just necessarily neurodiversity, but, you know, children are identified by comparing their behavior to their context, right? So if you have kids who are in maybe like lower SDS schools with less resources, you know, larger classrooms, kids that are coming from backgrounds that maybe there's more trauma there, more mental health concern there. Um, their ADHD behaviors or autism behaviors aren't going to stand out as much essentially. Whereas like if you have environments that have like higher SES environments, um, more resources, then those behaviors are gonna stand out more because they're really gonna look different from their peers. So again, identification challenges depending on context. So kind of like what Nick was saying with this COVID piece is like our more vulnerable groups are seeing much more challenges and more difficulties like exponentially. Um, so we've done our evaluation. We're trying to understand the behaviors in the context in which they developed. We have our team. Let's talk about goal setting. So first we're gonna talk about like IEP goals. That's kind of the lens specifically that we're talking about. Um, but this model of goal setting is gonna be really important in general. So even outside an IEP, outside of 504, it will be helpful at home. It will be helpful at what we do like mental health and behavior planning. Here's how we set goals. Um, we need to understand what are the expectations, first of all? So there was um, an article that came out that showed um, generally in these different age ranges, 
what are we trying to get them to do? Like, what are we targeting and what can we expect from them in these age ranges? So for elementary school, maybe middle school age, we're looking at some really basic foundations of like sitting still and sustained focused, checking work to like make sure we're not making those errors, like going back and looking at things. We're looking at perspective taking, being able to see things from another person's perspective, inhibiting some impulses, having some multiple step instructions for routines and homework, some initial organizational skills that they're gonna learn by observing parents and teachers or other peers, some repetition to like get those initial foundational skills under their belts. When they get to be more in high school age, they're gonna have their own systems of like how to organize, right? So it's not gonna be as much like a parent being like, you're gonna put your homework in this folder. It's gonna be like, they are gonna with support from parents and teachers figure out what works best for them and have their own systems that they implement. They're gonna prioritize goals and estimate time accurately to meet deadlines for these like longer term projects. They're gonna focus on more like self-motivation and self-regulation. Metacognition is an ability that they develop around this age. That's like reflecting on your thinking process and understanding how the effects of your behavior is on others. So it's taking that like perspective taking a little further by like seeing, <laughs> taking a different perspective to see yourself. And it's about self-advocacy because especially as they get again, more in this um, like space where they're independently responsible for their education, like in high school and college age years, they're gonna need to know how can I express what I need and make sure like who can give me what I need. Um, and there was like a comment, I think earlier in the slide of like, how do I support kids, you know, who don't want to <laughs> work with their parents? And it's like, yeah, self-advocacy is like an important skill to develop. I'm touching a little bit on the young adulthood milestones because this is where, again, as that transition to high school and college is going to happen, we need to be able to communicate our needs effectively, take responsibility for like our daily self-care. So if in the high school years, we can practice some of these things like managing our meds and sleep schedules, harnessing that focus when we need to, mastering emotional regulation. I don't know that I've mastered emotional regulation, so maybe I'm a little behind in my milestones, but um, as much as we can. So that's kind of like guideposts of like broadly, this is what we would expect. And then I'm gonna shift to specific examples of IEP goals um, that were developed um, Oh, this is more about goals. Yeah, specific IEP goals. So goals in general want to be specific, want to be measurable, like observe, like how are we going to observe we achieve this, want to be achievable of like realistic, want to be relevant to the behavior at hand, and want to be time bound. So we want to know like by what point can we expect this behavior to be showing up. Um, for IEPs in particular, they're reviewed yearly and they're reassessed every three years. 504s could be yearly or less than, kind of depending on if we're noticing whether or not the child is benefiting from these strategies. So these are going to be some examples of IEP goals for neurodiverse kids. Um, this is from the National Association of Special Education Teachers. So if you could see, I kind of organized them based on like what we might expect for our younger kids up to what, what we might expect for our older kids. And it's hard to give exact concrete cutoffs because like, developmentally, they could be in totally different places. Like um, neurodivergent kids in particular might have something called asynchronous development, which means that they could be quite actually advanced in some developmental areas and then quite behind in other developmental areas. So it's hard to say like they should all be in all these spheres functioning in this level because it's usually not that clear cut. So communication initially might be like practicing taking back and forth conversation, asking for help, and then maybe they're initiating interactions more or like suggesting how to sustain interactions with others as they get more advanced. And the four to five opportunities is not as, I think a common frequency, but I don't know necessarily why the research behind it. <laughs> so it could, it could be whatever frequency you feel is appropriate, but for some reason, all of these are like 80, whatever percent of the time and like four to five. So I don't know if they were just made up or if there's like a real reason for that, but 
four to five opportunities. So social skills will have initially maybe focusing on identifying what's going on with them and then shifting to, as we get more advanced, identifying what's going on with other people. Um, limiting interruptions, being able to describe the reasons for these social rules themselves instead of just being told, oh, you have to do this because this is what's expected. So some behavior goals could follow like, oh, a three-step direction, identifying and accepting a change in a routine, following the rules in the classroom, and then following the rules outside of the classroom. And then again, some of this self-advocacy as we get older, identifying when we need to take a break, and then independently request when you might need to use your accommodation. Again, that's going to be a goal for like some of our older students. This kind of got lumped into like occupational therapy goals, just because, again, from like an IEP standpoint, this would be more of the domain, but it doesn't necessarily have to be only OT. Um, not all kids would do that, but things like sensory processing needs are going to be under this category. Um, setting schedules, navigating the school building, also handwriting. So there's different levels of like knowing sensorily what processing is happening and how to request that, um, knowing when to request a break, knowing how to follow a schedule. Here's some accommodation examples. We'll have like a lot more of these later on, but just I threw them in there because I kind of directly compared IAP to 504. So like here's, uh, you know, these are very like specific and like four to five and, you know, these are what we're aiming, but then here's what might help us get there. They're going to have maybe like spaces for regulations and being able to leave the classroom or modifying the length of assignments. We're using peer modeling, like a student might be identified as being able to show the skill really effectively and can kind of help mentor another student. There's the daily visual reinforcements, social stories, right? So there's a lot of ways that we get here. Some of it comes through accommodation, and then some of it's going to come through direct intervention. So I was trying to look and see if there's any other questions about IEPs specifically or evaluation specifically, but it doesn't look like it. So we are going to shift gears to talking about how we, as the mental health providers, would implement these interventions and how we would coordinate these with parents and teachers. First, I wanna take a look at something called the ADHD iceberg. Um, I don't know who invented the ADHD iceberg, but it's like a common like thing where like, oh yeah, there's these like known invisible things, but, and then there's these really like not visible or overt things that are going on with ADHD. Um, and you can see things in there like a lot of them are going to be socio-emotional, right? Like we're having this or executive functioning um, more so than it is about like focusing on tasks. And someone created one for autism. And again, we see a lot of emotional regulation, executive functioning underlying most of these overt behaviors. So essentially, ADHD and autism are all about self-regulation. Like whether that's regulating your attention and your cognition, right, and your focus, you know, under-focusing or hyper-focusing, regulating your behaviors, like managing impulses and choosing the option that will like lead to the most effective outcome. That's regulating emotions when we feel those strong, intense emotions and like don't know what to do with them. Um, it's really all about regulation. And how do children develop regulation? Relationally, <laughs> usually starting in the parent-child relationship. And then as they get older, um, like our teens are gonna have a little bit more peer influence, but still very much the parenting relationship influence. And then at school, the teacher-child relationship influence. So all of these skills all come down to the relationship. So intervention is going to be relationally based, just has to be. So, and there's proof, <laughs> I'm not just making that up. There's proof that that's true. So when we look at what are evidence-based interventions saying for kids who have maybe dysregulation in the classroom or emotional dysregulation or behavioral dysregulation, this is coming from a meta-analysis 
which looks at a bunch of different studies and kind of coalesces the outcomes, the vast majority of them support parent training or behavior training methods in building these skills. And then there's some support for elements of like cognitive behavioral therapy or acceptance and commitment therapy, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. Um, but mostly it's going to be about the parent behavioral training relational methods. And so based on this meta-analysis, we'll see reduction of those inattentive and hyperactive symptoms. So even though it feels like weird to be like, well, the problem is they're not focusing, but you want to focus on like relationships. And they're like, yes, <laughs> yes, we do. It doesn't seem like it correlates, but it does. So inattentive hyperactive symptoms, decreased irritability, emotional ability, improved social adjustment, decreased antisocial behavior. So it's getting at all of these behaviors that we want to see that we want to see, like it's getting us the outcomes that we want, but it's again, really focusing on those relationships. I attached this year. This is called the Parenting Pyramid. It's from the Incredible Years um, intervention. Incredible Years is like a behavior management um, intervention for kids. And I, it might go up to middle school, but I really wanted to highlight it because if you look at like, what is the foundation of behavior change? There's so many things in there related to the relationship, like, you know, talking, listening, problem solving, rewards, setting limits, redirecting, and the consequences piece, like loss of privileges, timeout, all those things that we tend to focus on quite heavily initially, that's like at the very tip top of like you use selectively. So there's so many more things we could use in an intervention that are gonna be much more effective than honing in on timeouts or loss of privileges or consequences, right? Those are really not as effective. And if we're only focusing on those, we're definitely not gonna see the effectiveness because we're missing a lot of those foundational pieces. So one lens we can view this from is from a PCIT standpoint, um, parent-child interaction therapy is this model of treatment that is designed to support child behavior problems and child emotional dysregulation. It's been validated for parents and for teachers. Um, and it's designed for, again, more like elementary school kids, but we're gonna talk about how these skills will translate to older kids. And then we're gonna talk more about interventions that are designed for like our teens as well. But we start here with these basics of like the pride skills. Pride skills are how we improve like fostering the positive relationships pieces. Um, Cause proportionally much more of our communication should be in this realm compared to the disciplinary or offering criticism or discipline or consequences, right? Um, so instead of every interaction being like a battle, can we enhance more of these behaviors so that it feels less exhausting, honestly, for parents and teachers? And that includes things like praise, reflecting back, imitating, because they learn a lot based on modeling, describing. Um, a lot of research shows that if you are like attending and describing what a child is doing, it helps them sustain focus for longer and showing excitement to just be like, <laughs> we can have a different tone in the house sometimes or the classroom sometimes. So labeled praise can work for all ages. So it might, the principle is always the same. We're telling kids exactly specifically what we want to see more of by directly labeling it. But again, depending on how old the child is, that would look different. Like, oh, nice work taking turns and good job using your words. And versus like, wow, you really thought through the really carefully and made a good choice or thank you for asking before you left the house, right? It's same principle, but again, across different age ranges. Tell your kids exactly, specifically what you want to see them doing more of. Um, this also gets a little bit into something called positive opposite. So like at times we might fixate on what we don't wanna see happening. Like oh, we don't wanna have defiance and we don't wanna have aggressive behavior. We don't wanna have, you know, meltdowns as much, right? And so it helps to flip around. Okay, if you're not seeing those behaviors, what do you want them to actually do instead? Because the don't know stop is not telling them what they should be doing instead, right? So can we come up with 
a positive opposite of the behavior. So like a nice work taking turns with your sister would be like an opposite to like stop fighting with your sister, <laughs> things like that. So then if that, we have that foundationally, there's this also this principle called selective attention, um, which really comes from this fact that attention in and of itself is reinforcing for kids. And I know it doesn't sound like that, especially for our teens who are like, they want nothing to do with parents. Like, <laughs> but attention is reinforcing. And even kids will, when given the choice between no attention and negative attention, choose negative attention, which sounds counterintuitive, but I promise it's true. And then neurodivergent kids in particular are really engaged by things that are stimulating and so if they can push your buttons as an adult that is so fascinating and they will keep doing that like it's just interesting you know it's like not going to be like a good outcome you know that you're yelling you're punishing but they will keep doing it because it's interesting and so the way we can get around that is make any disciplinary piece or any type of time we're trying to redirect attention, make it clear that it's super boring and not reinforcing to like have this inappropriate behavior show up or have this punishment show up. And it's like much more interesting and engaging when we do the correct behavior. Like we really want to have that split. So ignore just like the minor irritating things but then re-engage right away when behaviors are appropriate or when that inappropriate behavior stops to make that clear distinction. Um, and this is also a little bit of uh, advice in terms of like pick your battles. Like you can't change everything all at once. So if there are just things I said that fall more into the realm of like just kind of inappropriate, like minor irritating, let those go and really get to the ones that are like significantly impairing functioning or like are more aggressive or dangerous. We really want to tone in on those first. So we don't want to ignore unsafe behaviors for sure. Um, sometimes we as adults get into trouble when we're trying to get compliance by not being very effective with the way we set up the commands. Like we're not helping our kids succeed and follow through with these things if we're not setting up the expectations in a way that is understandable to them. And so here are some skills of like, how do you tell a child what you expect of them? And again, this would be true for young kids and teens. So again, being specific about what you want, making that positive opposite, make sure it's developmentally appropriate, like that it's realistic that you're asking them to do what they, what you expect them to do make it more individual instead of compound. Like if they're really struggling with those multiple steps, you have to meet them where they're at and focus on those individual steps first. And that could be a goal, right? Providing a reason is gonna be really important. And this is helpful for, as we're trying to transition responsibility more with our older kiddos of like, they should be responsible for deciding, you know, what's a good choice and what's gonna give me an effective outcome. And we do that by sharing like our reasons for things of like, why would we expect this from them? Why is it important? Um, instead of just being like, because I said so, because that doesn't help them know what an effective choice is down the line when you're not there because you can't always be there. Um, how do they choose? How do they decide what's going to be effective? So give a reason of like, oh, hey, turn off that game in five minutes because we have to have some time to get ready to go to school, you know, whatever it is, just little things like that. Like the more you can get comfortable with explaining the rationale, using that neutral tone of voice to make sure it's not exciting. And then always, always, always we're praising after compliance. Like, oh, we're paying attention to what they're doing well. Because most often they're doing something well at some point in time. The kids aren't just always <laughs> messing up, if you will. Um, there was a question in the audience about um, pathological demand avoidance, which um, is a super interesting phenomenon where kids might have intense like anxiety or emotional reactions to having an expectation placed on them. And therefore that increases defiant behavior. We sometimes have like there's still a lot that research I think has to um 
understand more about it because it's not like a disorder or anything but it is this characteristic that can often be seen in our neurodivergent kids um, of like having the stress of an expectation and leading to defiant behavior and so the key with working with that is you're very much going to limit the commands you give them <laughs> like make sure it's really for the important things and then as I said that proportion of communication should be much more about the developing the relational pieces or the redirection and less so the demands, like <laughs> be less demanding essentially is what it is. Picking your battles or framing things as choices as much as possible rather than demands. So if you have like this need for them to do something in that moment, can you frame it as like, oh, do you wanna do this now or after dinner, right? So just reshaping the language a little bit. And then as we're working on these compliance strategies with pathological demand avoidance, we'll start on easier, simpler, accessible things like telling them to do something that they might already want to do or like not have a problem with doing so they get more exposure and more comfort with meeting expectations essentially. So that's yeah, kind of what the preliminary research would be about that, but there's still a lot we have to Learn about. Um, reinforcement. Reinforcement is what it sounds like is when they do something well or like something along the lines of expectations, we want to associate that with a really positive outcome. And neurodivergent kids and teens especially need support in building that internal motivation because you might just think to yourself like oh well if they do well in school they get good grades isn't that motivation enough and it's like for some kids probably but if there's like this real pull to like oh the short-term gratification versus the longer term potential benefit they're much more going to gravitate to the short term so we have to make sure that it is reinforcing for them to do this non-preferred task and internal motivation is built over time if we have this external scaffolding. scaffolding. So like maintaining this behavior builds that self-efficacy, builds that self-esteem, and builds motivation to continue. So we can build internal motivation. They just need a lot more external support and structure to do so. So we do that with external tangible reinforcement at first. And it's not a bribe because we're not paying them up front. <laughs> they have to <laughs> do the thing in order to get the thing that they want. And to be fair, we as adults use reinforcement all the time. Like how many of you would be at your job if you weren't getting paid? Like there's, you know, I love what I do, but I also need money. So that is just like, it makes sense. We don't pay kids to go to school. We just expect them to do it <laughs> for whatever, you know, longer term outcome reasons. So maybe it's fair of like, they should be reinforced for building these skills too. And at the end, reinforcement, praise is an example of reinforcement. So it, all, it doesn't always have to be tangible either. So when selecting a reinforcement, we definitely want input from our kiddos. And <laughs> what do they want? Because not every kid wants the same thing. And then the schedule is also really important. So initially reinforcement should be very small and frequent um, to help them buy into the system and again, help them feel more effective. And then as those skills become more consistent, we increase our expectations before then giving that reinforcement. So it should be dynamic over time. It shouldn't just maintain like anytime you do this, you always get this. And then we also want opportunities for earning larger rewards. So we kind of want a mix of like, oh, here's our more smaller frequent outcomes. And then we can also have building that over time, have like a larger potential outcome. So I think one mistake parents often make or teachers often make is like, you know, like if you get straight A's all semester, then you can go to Disneyland, right? Then that's like, oh, that's like really cool. But like, Again, when it comes to the short term versus the long term, when it's like in the nighttime and they just want to play that video game, they're not thinking about potentially being able to go to Disneyland in three months. They're going to be doing what's right in front of them. So it has to be short term and long term. And we're pairing all reinforcement with praise and positive attention because that's kind of the key underlying reinforcer. So then. I wanna talk a little bit about validation. So this would be something 
that more is translatable as well across age ranges. As we're moving into the teen years and that relationship, um, they essentially have to buy into things more um, or have more reasons for why they're doing what they do. And so validation comes from the need that like they have to feel like their side is heard and understood. Um, they're not going to be receptive to like changing a behavior if they feel like everything they're feeling or thinking is dismissed. Like if you're just trying to force the issue. And so validation also separates emotions from behaviors. Like if, you know, a a child gets angry and act inappropriately, we definitely want to have consequences for that behavior, but we still want to validate where that emotion came from so we can help them learn to have like an alternative coping strategy. And validation does not equal, doesn't have to equal agreement. Like you don't have to see things the same way that they do. You don't have to agree that their perspective is accurate, but you have to understand that it's their perspective and it's real to them and they need to know that. So we're doing things like paying attention, reflecting words back. So in some ways these echo the pride skills before, but now we're expanding it a little bit to be older. So we're looking how, how does their emotion make sense given their past experiences, how it might fit that situation and to be genuine. So like an example of this could potentially be like your teen fails a math quiz, but you know, they didn't study for it. <laughs> but they're still really upset that they failed. And so we might be pulled to be like, well, you should study next time. And that might be accurate, but the child's not going to, the teen's not going to be receptive to that until we at least acknowledge kind of like what they're going through and helping them build that internal motivation. So you might attend to it. You might see like, oh yeah, it's really sucks that you failed that. I know that's hard. Um, and if they don't articulate that directly, you can try to read their nonverbals and check in if that's accurate. You look for that, how that emotion makes sense. Be like, yeah, it does hurt to fail things. And like, I know it was really important to you to do better in school right now. And then when that emotion has kind of calmed down a little bit, you can offer support and problem solving and thinking about, okay, like maybe we need more of a study schedule or we need to understand like what got in the way of the issue. Or like maybe we don't go to that party on Friday and we focus on setting the test, but you have to take that emotion down a notch first. Um, this was some strategies developed by Dr. Robin. He has an intervention for like family therapy about like how we communicate with teens and or how teens communicate with the family and give some like concrete examples of like kind of like positive opposites of like if you're noticing this pattern of communication try this pattern of communication instead um and so these can be some like concrete goals that we would work towards in like parenting or family therapy with older teens or between parents themselves. These are also helpful when thinking about coordinating between parents and teachers of like, if we get caught in these communication patterns, it's not gonna be an effective collaborative relationship. And so that's kind of why I like these really concrete goals. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about values and that's for like multiple different reasons. So values can help when you're working with families that come from different backgrounds and different expectations. Like obviously every family is gonna have like a different parenting style. Every teacher is gonna have a different teaching style and evidence-based parenting interventions sometimes lack this like cultural sensitivity component of like, they might not always share the same alignment on like this should be the goal or this should be the way we implement the goal. And so by starting with values, we create goals that they buy into that they would agree are the goals and it increased trust with providers, um, which sometimes mistrust could be a problem too, or increased trust among each other. And so um, thinking about what a value is, values are like if life is a journey, Values are the compass that keeps us, you know, directionally focused on where we want to be. And then goals are like the destinations or things we can check off. So you can never check off a value because it's always just something that you live 
with like wanting to make those decisions in line. And the same value can have multiple behaviors that would fall in line. So some values that come up in this context when it comes to child behaviors that parents might want or that teachers might want, we, they might value responsibility, they might value independence, they might value learning. And so what I would love for us to do is take a second and think about what are some shared values of like how might we create alignment with people that have different goals or different ideas of what expectations should be. What are some common values that parents might have or that teachers might have? Like, what are some values that we would want to make our decisions about and use as a guidepost? So I will pause here. Hopefully the Slido is still active. It's been a long, it's been a little bit since we used the Slido. So yeah, think about, or just what values do you have? <laughs> what are some good common values that we can maybe all agree on, even if we have different opinions? Um, I'm seeing some in the chat, empathy, Um, yeah. Oh, there was a thing I missed a little bit in the chat earlier of like, it's hard to work with parents who say this feels fake and it's just not them. Yeah. The reinforcement piece. So that's, this is where the values piece comes in for those who feel like this style of parenting is just not me or like this focus on praise and validation. Um, we can get alignment by like focusing on values. So say they value kindness and compassion, empathy, respect, responsibility, independence, respect for other persons and belongings. Yeah, these are awesome. Um, so in order, if you value empathy as a parent, you have to demonstrate empathy as a parent. <laughs> like if you want your child, if you want your child to be empathetic, to the people around them. And that's a common complaint I hear from parents, especially with our neurodiverse kids of like, they just do whatever they want to do. They don't care how their behavior affects others, right? Um, they feel understandably kind of like hurt and frustrated by that. Um, but if you want them to do that, you have to demonstrate that. That's where the validation piece comes from. Like you have to model that, you have to teach them that. Um, so that could be some alignment there if we're feeling like parents get a bit stuck on the, like, what the child should be doing. Yeah. Oh, there was a question just posted of, like, kids to take breaks in class. We are definitely going to get there. I promise. We're getting there. Okay. So here's an example of how values can also be used for creating alignment between parents and teens. So say, like, parents are really focused on grades, and the teen is like, no, I want to spend time with my friends. That's more important to me. So we look at, okay, like what underlies that behavior? The teen values relationships because they really want to have a sense of belonging. They really want to feel that emotional support and validation. Parents really want their teens to get good grades because we want them to have all these opportunities. We want them to be successful and not be limited in life. And so a potential goal would be things like, well, if we can get the teen aligned with the parents on like how the same behavior meets both of their values, that is a shared goal they would then work on and agree to. So like if we're working towards college, we would also frame that as like a, well, that would increase your sense of belonging. <laughs> like you would be in that community. You would have all these opportunities for other activities and social groups. You would increase your relationships. Um, you might also be better maintaining the relationships you currently have. Like if you're struggling with grades and not being able to go to college, but all your friends are, you know, <laughs> how are you going to continue that relationship? Right. So you frame it based on things they already want and prioritize. And then parents are satisfied because it focuses on things they want and prioritize, right? So finding that alignment, we would do that between parents and teachers as well. Like it, sometimes people get stuck on like what the other person should be doing. But if we both agree that we want to see this thing for their kid, then that helps create shared goals. So here are some additional like 
communication strategies for like that parent-child collaboration that is less based on like defensiveness or blame that can show up understandably so but thinking through oh I've noticed this works really well in the classroom maybe this could be helpful at home or vice versa or just being like oh do you have any suggestions of how we can help this behavior right so just keeping it open keeping it collaborative okay we're going to shift a little bit now into accommodations or intervention strategies that would work in the classroom and that would work at home if we're really trying to like also sustain homework behavior or routine behavior etc i want to touch on a little bit about sensory processing so we do know that our neurodiverse kiddos have differences in sensory processing that can either be a result of like under stimulation or over stimulation so at a baseline level it seems like neurodiverse kids need a different level of sensory input to stay focused and stay alert so that misbehavior might be a reflection of like they just need more sensory information because remember reactions from adults are stimulating <laughs> so they might get to you to misbehave because that may be just the need for more stimulation. So these are ways that we could potentially increase that sensory input to help them stay engaged. So some examples of like having increased pressure, whether that's like weighted, weighted vests or blankets, having opportunities to take breaks for vestibular senses, having quiet fidget tools. So that can include things you can squish, smooth things you can rub. Um, some of those like little blocks that can just like, there's little things like that. I would say probably not a fidget spinner. That tends to be a little too distracting. You kind of want to balance the like sensory input that could just be used to feel something versus like you're so engaged in that thing that it takes away from the strategy. So people have different tactile needs. Um, so that's why there's like many different types of fidget tools that exist. Um, I would also say that like slime could be fun maybe at home, but probably not at school <laughs> either. So we wanna have things that are like quiet, not messy and not too distracting for other kids. Um, drawing could also be a good option for that. We want auditory stimulation. So having things like kids allowing during like quiet work time or test taking time, be able to listen to things on headphones, having um, lighting adjustments, like in schools in particular, those like fluorescent lights could be quite, you know, overwhelming for a lot of people. So having like different lamps or opportunities for different lighting or movement or watching things that move, Drawing would also fall in that category as well. Things like chewing gum or mints or having quiet snacks accessible or scented markers. Um, I know when I was a kid, we were obsessed with those like markers. <laughs> if you remember them, if you know, you know. Um, so there's a lot of ways to increase sensory input in a way that's either effective for taking a break or not going to be disruptive in the classroom setting or at home if we're trying to do homework. Then we have kind of the opposite side of things where there might be too much sensory input and having these sensory overwhelm that might be, again, misinterpreted as just like defiance, tantrums, panic attacks. And usually it's not necessarily a single trigger, more of like a stacking of things. Like if, you know, there's something, you know, the fire alarm goes off and, you know, I'm wearing an uncomfortable sweater, it might also feel like the lights are too bright, but not always, where, you know, it's just like sometimes it's a combination of things. So here are some supports that would be helpful to mitigate that sensory overwhelm. So we have noise canceling headphones or earplugs. If we're taking a test or doing work in a quiet location, separated from others, if that's too distracting, or if they're like tools that they need might be distracting for others, could they take the test with the tools um, that won't be distracting for others? Comfortable clothing, snacks that feel safe and don't have weird textures, taking a break to calm down, step away, regulate, right? 
These are all the ways that we would address sensory overwhelm. So it's kind of a combination of those things. And part of um, a goal for intervention would be to help the child articulate which is it under or over <laughs> and therefore what tools do they have at their disposal. So strategies support cognitive and learning, aka kind of like executive functioning skills could look like this, there was a question in here um, earlier about like, what um, are some strategies? I think it was like, if a child isn't listening because they zone out or misdirections or miss things. And these are classroom strategies to kind of help increase engagement and redirect focus for those kids that are zoning out or not listening. Um, it helps for teachers, for instance, to kind of like move around when they're teaching. That just, again, is more engaging and stimulating to look at. Um, it also gives the opportunities for them to kind of like physically check in with each student, whether it's like touching a shoulder or just kind of like tapping on a desk. And you would do it to like all the kids, not just like targeting the neurodivergent kids. It's just like as a thing you do. And like, oh, I walk over here and I tap on their desk and I walk over here and I tap on their desk. Like while we're teaching, kind of, again, it's more dynamic, helps check in sometimes those taps um use student names and examples so if you're trying to create like a math problem for instance if you know you know little johnny tends to struggle with attention you might be like johnny bought 20 watermelons and then at the cue of their name they'll look up so use student names in your examples give students different jobs and errands to help out like if you need to send something to the office utilize a student that would love that break to kind of like walk around and feel like oh, they're helping out and increasing their effectiveness or passing out any handouts to kids um, or collecting things, right? So like give them involvement, start a discussion instead of just talking at them, um, getting that eye contact as much as possible, giving the entire class opportunities to move around. Um, and if there are like specific behaviors you want to cue these neurodiverse students without like embarrassing them or targeting them in front of other kids, you can develop like a secret signal of like, when I do this, you know, that means, you know, we're focusing on that specific behavior. And then in general, using like multiple modalities. So verbal instruction, visual instructions, or like pictures slash typed on words, tactile information to engage in class. Um, so again, these are strategies that I think tend to help everyone and might be especially helpful for our neurodivergent kids. So many people, not just kids, not just teens, adults even, have a hard time with getting started. <laughs> you might know exactly what it is you're supposed to be doing and when you should do it, but then the actual like inertia of getting started is so hard. So here are some strategies when it's like maybe homework time or dedicated work time, what you would do. So in addition to might having some like external cues of like, oh, time to get started, associating with that visual or that sound, sometimes the barrier to getting started is that the task feels pretty overwhelming. Like the thought of like, oh my gosh, this is gonna take so long. And like, I don't know if I wanna like devote all that time to it. You would dedicate maybe like a certain amount of time. Like, oh, I'm gonna start this for like five minutes and see what I can get done in five minutes. And if I wanna stop, I can stop or 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And typically once, the neurodivergent brain especially gets to from like not doing things mode to doing things mode it's you know maybe that's how we can trick our hyper focus so we can sustain on task and like oh it's been 10 minutes but i'm actually like really into this thing and i'm going to keep going or we stop but then it's a lot easier to like start something you've already started than like breaking that barrier of initially starting the task so again break that barrier to task initiation with those like time constraints. You can have a peer accountability partner. So this would be things like, and maybe at school, like having someone that you would work with or at home, a sibling, whatever that is, if like they're working on something too, sometimes that's helpful. And then talking through a plan to get started. If they're feeling really overwhelmed by a task, they're like, okay, what would you do? And what would that next step be? And what would that next step be? And if they feel like, okay, they can see the end and they can see how they get there verbally, they might get started behaviorally. 
for organizations, one, we have to tell them how to organize things because I think maybe we just like hand them a planner and are like, here you go. And like, <laughs> no one, they might not know how to use it effectively or maybe a planner is just not an effective system for them. So we're gonna help them set up the pieces of the system and also regularly check in with them like how it's going. And like, if there does need to be some changes cause it's not sustained. Um, we're gonna have a dedicated place for completing homework. And like, that's where we go. And that's where we put all the homework stuff. We're gonna have deadlines, not only the big like final assignment deadlines, but deadlines for doing each of the individual steps. And it's gonna be visual and it's gonna be obvious. Time management. Time blindness is a real struggle with these neurodiverse kids. Time blind, yeah. So we need to help them realize what time feels like. So that would be things like before a task, having them estimate how long they think it will be and then having them check afterwards if that was accurate or maybe like, oh, that actually, you thought that would take five minutes, but it took 20 minutes or you thought that was gonna take like an hour, but you actually, when you like sat down to get it done, it was like 20 minutes, you know? So it could work both ways. Uh, we wanna give warnings for task transitions as much as possible. You know, we're gonna turn that off in five minutes. We're gonna go in like a minute things like that. And we want to have them have access to things that show time, whether that's clocks, phones, watches, to just so they can keep checking in with themselves. I put this section in here about processing speed, because if you recall way back in the assessment time, um, all the different cognitive domains that we could assess, processing speed tends to be one where kids show a little bit of a relative weakness, meaning that like it takes them like longer to do things or longer to take in information. Um, and so that can really be overwhelming for class or school avoidance if they feel like this homework packet, which maybe other students we could reasonably expect for them to complete in 15 minutes is taking them like hours just because it's like <laughs> that processing speed is slow maybe we just reduce that load of like can they show what they learn effectively in a shorter amount of problems can we give them extended time to complete tests if they're feeling that time pressure um, if you're asking them a question or giving them a prompt and they don't answer right away don't get like mad or frustrated about that but just say like okay like take some time to think about it and I'll check back in in a minute right like Sometimes they need that additional space, especially if they're being pulled out of like wherever their attention was focused on. And then again, always having those visual aids to like reduce the brain load of what they have to hold in their head. For writing papers, this is a big barrier for our neurodivergent students as well. I think there's a study that showed that um, of the learning challenges that exist, I think disability and written expression is the, the highest one. <laughs> because writing is so complex and completing writing papers I write all the time it's still really hard for me so we use things like verbal dictation like maybe as a preliminary step we have the student just talk through either with software or having someone else type for them and they go back through and like edit it we give feedback after each step like what's your paper topic okay here's what the outline looks like okay here's your intro right um, we're building in that editing time so you're not done when it's done you've got to go back and make sure you look through things. And we wanna support the student in researching, like how do we evaluate the quality of sources? Maybe some adults need some support in that too. So anyway, we wanna help them with all the steps. I'm gonna transition a little bit. We're gonna talk about routines. Oh no, in a second. One more thing about college planning. Oh, I almost forgot. So with college planning or transitioning to college, we want to one, look at what external supports exist through our college student disability services. Remember those 504s can exist in college, but not necessarily the IEPs, but data from those they'll want. Um, and there are colleges that have programs for students specifically like targeting neurodiverse students. There might have things where it's like, oh, there's like a transition period if they have like a little bit extra orientation or they take some classes over the summer just to get used to the environment, get used to the structure. So be looking for those things and build independence for daily life tasks. So it's not as jarring when all of a sudden they're by themselves and having to do everything by themselves when they were like at home and not doing that really help them like take on the choice of like managing meds and their own schedules beforehand. Okay, let's go to some examples of effective routines or how we might structure those. And Nick is going to take over here.
All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so as we've mentioned a couple different times today, um, routines are very important for helping kids kind of make it from bed to the classroom or from homework to bed or, you know, all those different steps that everybody has to go through throughout the day. Um, one of the best strategies that we have, um, especially with kids who are neurodivergent, who tend to be really high in visual spatial skills, um, is using visual cues to help them go through a routine. So this is just one example I found um, of a morning routine. Um, and these tasks can be broken down further if needed. So, you know, for something like breakfast, you can see there, um, if there's a specific recipe or something that the kid tends to enjoy, you know, you can have them uh, have their own routine for how to make, you know, a bowl of cereal. Um, grooming and getting dressed are, are big ones, remembering things to like brush teeth, put on deodorant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are things that can be included in almost like a subroutine, um, but helping the kid kind of have an idea of like, this is how the events of the morning are gonna go. Um, can really start um, the kid on a path to success. So um, here's another example um, for homework routine, set and start and finish, setting start and finish times um, can be done either uh, by day of the week or just having it be like consistent um, each day. Um, it's helpful to follow the child's daily rhythms um, and try to find out, you know, when do they tend to be the most awake and engaged? Those are going to be the times um, where you want them to be trying to do homework. So, um, you know, because the, the second you interview, introduce like screen time or something, which we'll get to, um, even if kids are very tired, usually, um, especially if they're big gamers or TV watchers, th they'll be okay doing that when they're <laughs> When they're a little more tired, but you really want to save that um, that time uh, when they're awake and engaged for homework. Um, and dedicated homework spots, um, lists of tasks to help them prioritize, um, five minute breaks for every twenty minutes of work. There's a there's a thing called the Pomodoro method that I've always really enjoyed. Pomodoro means tomato in uh, Italian, um, and uh, because the guy who invented it had a timer that looked like a tomato. And so he very creatively just paired it like that. So, um, and then having an activity again, like whether it's um, hanging out with friends or screen time or something to look forward to after homework can be really helpful. Uh, and then lastly, this is just like a small um, example. Um, this one is of a bedtime routine. This one's kind of dear, uh, geared towards smaller kids, but it can be adapted for teens as well. Um, and this one goes kind of through the entire evening from dinner to going to sleep. Um, and uh, they have blank ones that you can find on the internet. It might be like a good creative exercise to have your child go through and make their own with their own clip art or something like that um, can be um, really reinforcing as well. So these are just kind of different ways to introduce like visual cues and routines into a kid's life. Um, and from there, I'll throw it back to Laura. Hello. Um, thanks for your patience as we're doing this back and forth transition. We're in like two different places, but um, I wanna talk in this little last time we have left about screen time. And it's kind of like indirectly related to the topic today, but of the things that I hear most overwhelming like complaints about from parents, teachers is like the screens, you know, they're always on their phone, always playing video games and not being able to do what they're supposed to do. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about what the data shows. Let's think about how we might set effective limits um, because in this, day and age. I mean, we are all currently on a screen right now. Like our life is screen. So how can we incorporate this with our kids? First, 
just answering the question of like, how much are kids actually using screens? This was from a study that the CDC conducted that broke it down into different, different age groups. Like on average, these kids in these age ranges are spending six hours, nine hours, or 11 to five, 11.5 hours daily on screens, which is a lot of time. <laughs> like if that's an average, there's going to be some above that and some below that. Um, and evidence indicates that screen time might be higher in our neurodiverse populations. But like, okay, how, how much is a lot? Like, how much is too much? Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends two hours as a daily limit for screens. And we might see some adverse effects on physical and mental health for daily use that is three or four hours more or daily. And when I read that, I was like, <laughs> dang, <laughs> that's not very much time at all. Um, however, I just wanna draw attention to some facts that like these studies were conducted prior to COVID times when like our society like more shifted to like having things available on screens for really functional reasons. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, limitations on our research about screen time in kids that I want to address here before everyone starts freaking out being like two hours, you know. So first of all, what is screen time? We don't have like a great definition for that medically clinically societally like is it literally any time you're in front of a screen versus like some limited to like passive um receipt of information like tv or youtube videos or tiktok like if you're just sitting there taking in information that's like the bad screen time whereas like more engaging screen time like what we're doing you know with like connecting with other people and like video games and to some extent could be more better screen time and maybe is not as bad. So there's a lot of like judgment language in here. There's a lot of like not having a clear understanding of what it is we're talking about. There's also limited comparisons between neurotypical versus neurodiverse children in this literature. It discounts socioeconomic status. Like we don't have a lot of nuance when we say, oh, this is the limit for this population or for this age range. Methodologies focus primarily on self-report, so we don't actually know, like, causally and effectively, you know, like, what's actually causing these things, and we might attribute it to, like, <laughs> the teens always are like, my parents will just blame everything by the fact that I'm just on my phone too much, <laughs> and, like, sometimes it's a narrative we get strung up. Limited longitudinal studies and the recommendations overlook potential benefits of screen time, which... There could be a lot, especially for these neurodiverse kids. I think the biggest one is that social connection for individuals who struggle in other environments, screen time is so effective for our neurodiverse kids to engage with people that are like them, that have similar interests. Um, I think there was a question in um, either on the Slido or in before about like, how do we help the LGBTQA plus kids who really struggle with peer connection, like this is a big one. They connect through online groups and social media, especially if they're an LGBTQA plus kid living in Utah. Sometimes that's the only option they have is online. And so do we really wanna limit that? Do we really wanna say like, like, we can't have that really adaptive, supportive place for them because it's being on a screen, right? Is screen time really like, not as effective as in-person time, or if we don't have that access to in-person time, screen time can be really effective. Digital media can support exploring those interests and learning skills. I, both of these are neurodiverse kids love to deep dive into like their special interest topic. And so <laughs> that's what media can do. Um, it gives self-expression. If we're having a hard time articulating what's going on with us and why social media or screen time gives that avenue and it's stress relief. So we don't want to demonize it. We want to be realistic about it. So here's some ways to like change screen habits if we feel like it's getting a bit out of hand or really negatively impacting like daily living tasks. We want to increase opportunities for like off-screen activities. Again, think about that positive opposite. If you don't want them on their computer or on their phone, what do you want them doing instead? Can we reinforce that? We have to model that as adults. We have to take technology breaks, have dedicated time for attention, make sure we're monitoring from a safety standpoint and using those parental blocks as much as possible. Here's a guideline of like how to set um, 
rules with teens, noting acceptable and unacceptable uses, restrict devices at bedtime. If anything, like what whatever is like most consistent in the research, I know I had said like, oh, there's limitations. Like the biggest, biggest message that I think was clear cut was like no devices at bed, bedtime, nighttime. So if you are looking for like a clear, what do I do? Bedtime is a good place to start to reject those devices. Um, and one thing that people do when we think about like reinforcements or consequences is like using screens like unilaterally as like a reinforcement for things that are unrelated. And so guidelines for teens suggest that like only take away the device if they're using it inappropriately, but don't use it as like a punishment for like an unrelated behavior. Um, so to recap in our last few minutes here, we've noticed COVID has had long-term implications on cognitive and emotional development. We need a thorough assessment to understand individual strengths and weaknesses. Self-regulation is some of these core underlying deficits and relationships are the key to behavior change. So, and there's things I think, I just wanna acknowledge that play a role in this that we didn't get to, which is like one, the education system right now, especially is like really stressed and like, you know, the teachers are quitting their jobs and like, college students are teaching, you know, they, they, that's a teacher burnout, parent burnout, right? So there's like, I think a lot of supports that adults need individually in order to be like effective with their kids. So we didn't really get to that. We didn't get as much into the peer relationship specifically. As I said, these screen time and social media boundaries are effective in that realm. These social communication skills are effective in the, that realm. But um, that's maybe like a piece that we didn't get to as much today. And yeah, this is a very broad topic. So I was like, well, we got to cut somewhere. But we provided some resources. Like if you're interested in following up with any of these more specifically, if there's a topic we didn't cover, we love these organizations and we have like all of our references if you really want to look at it. But um, in this last little bit of time, we'll take... Um, there is, we'll take any questions um, in this last little bit of time. I am noticing one in the chat just now, of, like people feel like they need the TV to fall asleep uh, neuro, and that's common. So sometimes um, neurodiverse kids and teens need stimulation for sleep. So there's like, I think a variety of ways to get off that that isn't watching TV or using screens because that blue light, as I said, it's going to really affect their sleep negatively. Um, ASMR, yeah. So like um, sound is fine. So if you have like stimulating sounds like um, white noise or nature sounds or like a podcast or a book that's kind of like, you know, low volume sounds can be really effective. Um, there are a lot of, there's evidence a lot coming out now that um, people prescribe like a short low dose stimulant for sleep time in specifically, which sounds counterintuitive because you're like, doesn't stimulate negatively and affect sleep, but actually it like shows that it helps focus on sleep and removes like the noisiness and distractibility of the brain that can get it in the way of sleep and can help our neurodiverse kids. So I recommend trying a couple of those strategies instead of TV because TV, I think pretty clear cut has some negative effects. So um, any other questions or anything? Thank you so much for joining us today. That was a long one. And like, um, yeah, I'm so glad for you guys. And if you need anything, I think um, Jen gave you our contact information. There's feedback forms. We love to hear from you. Like we do the CEs all the time. And we really just want to know like what's most helpful for you guys out in the other community. So like if there's a topic that we haven't covered that you would love to know more about, just yeah, I'm sure someone here has some <laughs> passion or expertise in it. We're a very diverse team. So let us know. Thank you so much. And you have a good rest of your weekend and good luck with back to school time.